in this section, I'm going to be talking about uh, modeling the cores in Jump 5. Um, I've been told that if Maillard wants enough time tomorrow to do his thing, we need to start moving a little faster. So we'll see if we can do that. Um, although I think all of this is very important, so we'll see. Um, OK. So um, in this section, we're going to talk about the different kinds of CPU models that Gem5 has, um, using how to use these CPU models. So, so we're going to set up a simple system. We're going to look at the generated statistics and kind of see the differences between some of these CPU models, and then um, create a custom processor, which yeah, we'll see how, how we're doing on time, whether or not we do that. OK, so the Gem5 CPU models. So this is now we're talking about sim objects. Not the standard library, but we're diving into um, what the standard library is wrapping. So uh, these sim objects. So we have a base CPU, and from base CPU, we have three different types of CPU, or four different types: KVM CPU, simple CPU, um, O3 CPU, and minor CPU. Um, and then the KVM CPU is specialized for ARM and x86. And then the base simple CPU can be either timing or atomic. So we'll talk about most of these. Okay. So simple CPU, so there's both timing and atomic um, options. So I want to take a, a, a moment, and um, we'll probably talk about this again uh, later, but I want to take a moment and talk about the difference between atomic accesses, functional accesses, and timing accesses. So Gen 5's memory system, I know we're talking about cores, but Gen 5's memory system has three different types or ways you can access the memory system. So, the one that I think we would be um, most interested in is timing down at the bottom. So this uh, models everything with split transactions. So you send a request, and then the function ends, your event ends. And then at some time later, you get a response. There's some callback function that happens sometime later. So we have two different call stacks that are usually executing in different events um, that are separated with simulation time. Atomic, on the other hand, um, can really be thought of more like uh, debug accesses. Atomic memory accesses, if you do uh, an atomic read, then when you call that function, after that function returns, you have the result. So atomic takes zero time, and it's essentially in the same call stack. So there's no uh, split transaction there. Um, so this is used for fast forwarding, as we'll see um, tomorrow morning, maybe later today, um, or for warming up uh, parts of the system. And then there's functional accesses. So sorry, uh, atomic accesses, yeah, are, are not the debug accesses. Those are used for uh, warming up and fast forwarding. Functional accesses are the debugging accesses. So functional accesses are used if you are um, trying to fake something, so maybe you're implementing like a system call in SE mode, and you need to directly access things in memory, then you can use a functional access just to get that data functionally. Um, so this bypasses everything in the system and just gets the data. So the atomic CPU does all of its accesses atomically, and the timing CPUs do all of their accesses using timing. You can't mix timing and atomic but you can mix functional um, with atomic and timing. Any questions? We'll see this a little bit. We'll see this again and again, actually, as we go through. OK, so we have the atomic C uh, simple CPU, uh, uses atomic memory accesses. Um, this is really just used for fast forwarding, um, and you can, depending on the cache model, warm up the caches. Um, and then timing simple CPU is the timing accesses. So this is a very simple CPU. You can think of it kind of like a single cycle uh, CPU. Um, every single execution of an instruction actually takes zero time. It doesn't even take one cycle. Um, and then memory accesses take however long the memory access takes. So memory is uh, modeled timing correctly, and then all the instructions just complete immediately. So. The timing simple CPU is useful um, to test out timing models or if you don't care at all about the CPU performance. OK, so then we have the O3 CPU. So O3 is um, out of order, 000 O3 CPU. Um, 
So this does timing memory accesses, um, and it does execute and execute. It has branch prediction. It has out-of-order execution. It has a reorder buffer, rename, physical register files, et cetera. Um, and then there's, there's these ideas of time buffers between each stage, so you can make each stage take however long you think those stages should take. This is a very highly parameterized uh, model. Um, I'll say it's based on, so this is the original O3 model from M5. Back in, it was probably written in 2004, 2005. So you can imagine it might be a little bit out of date with the way modern out of order cores work. Um, as I said, it has lots and lots of parameters. We saw this briefly um, yesterday as well. Uh, it's um, difficult to get this to be configured in a reasonable way. So just be careful as you're configuring this. Um, the other thing I want to note is, so this has a lot of parameters, but um, if you want to modify these parameters, you should extend this with a standard library based CPU core um, or CPU core instead of going in and modifying these parameters. In general, you should never change the parameters in the sim object files. And my art, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Any questions about the O3 CPU? Well, I'm sure there are, lot, there are lots of questions, but anything that I can go a little bit deeper on right now? OK. Um, then we have the minor CPU. So this is an in-order CPU design. This is somewhat based on um, ARM's high-performance in-order core. So it has four stages um, with uh, buffers in between the stages. So you can actually model the amount of time it takes to send information back and forth. Um, and then register files, uh, the um, yeah, modeled register files as well. So there's a four-stage in-order pipeline. I think it's dual issue. So then we have the KVM CPU. Uh, the KVM CPU, um, so KVM is the kernel-based virtual machine. We will talk a lot more about this when Jian Tong talks about accelerating simulation. Uh, but briefly, we can, so KVM is the Linux kernel's way of exposing the uh, hardware virtualization extensions. So like what um, Zen VMware or QEMU uses to get uh, really high performance virtualization. Um, when we use the KVM CPU model in Gen 5, we're essentially using the native CPU as our CPU model. So we can run at native speed and fast forward. But you get no timing information out of this. This is essentially functional only fast forwarding. But it's very fast, as we'll see later. Um, this is only implemented for x86 and ARM right now. Um, and in order to get this to work, your guest um, ISA, so like if you're simulating x86 and Gen 5, has to match the host that you're running on. So if you want to do x86, you have to be running on an x86 host. If you want to use ARM, you have to be running on an ARM host. Um, so that's uh, another caveat there. Yeah? Uh, does it remind me for the same ISA, also extend ISA extensions and stuff like that for instructions and all of that? Yeah, exactly. So you know, if you um, are running on a I'll say this, although it's not quite right. So if you want to model something like an AVX2, you need to be on hardware that has AVX2 um, in order to get it to work. I'm saying it's not quite right because actually Gem 5 doesn't implement AVX2, but that's an example. <laughs> so yeah, good question. And I'll say on ARM, it's kind of a pain to get KVM working um, because you have to have the right interrupt controller. It has to match the hardware. It has to be something Gem 5 understands and something your kernel understands, both on the host and the guest. Um, it's a bit of a magic wand to get uh, KVM on ARM working. OK, so as a quick summary here, uh, the KVM CPUs are very fast, no timing, no caches, no branch predictor, nothing like that. The simple CPUs are fast. You can get timing out of it if you're using the timing sim uh, CPU. Um, and you can get really good detailed information about your memory system and caches. And then the O3 CPU and minor CPU, these are the models you want to be using if you care about the CPU performance. So it's either O3 or in order, or an out of order, or an in order design. But they are pretty slow. It takes a long time to run things when you're using these. Um, but you can 
get the full suite of your cache information, branch predictors, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I know I'm going over this kind of quickly. Questions? OK. No questions usually means either everybody's getting everything or nobody's getting anything. I feel like I may be on the second part of it here, but oh well. So another thing I want to say is a little bit more about how these CPU models interact with everything else. Um, so we'll see more of this as we start to talk about adding instructions and how these CPU models are implemented. But I think it's worth uh, giving a quick overview now. So the CPU model, like, you know, everything in Gen 5 is meant to be really modular. So the CPU model uses three different um, uh, interfaces to interact with the rest of the system. So on the top here, we have the execution context, which, execute, which interacts with the ISA subsystem. So uh, by exposing this execution context, or imp so the CPU model implements the execution context, that is how the ISA actually executes the instructions. So that's how you can have one O3 CPU model that can execute both ARM instructions and x86 instructions. Then to interact with memory, the CPU model uses the instruction and data ports. So there's um, two ports on the CPU which connect to memory. One is the instruction port and the other is the data port. Um, and this is how it interacts with memory. And then there's this other interface called the thread context which the CPU exposes, where the rest of the simulator can get information out of the CPU. So if for some reason you have some device or something that needs to access a register in the CPU, so if you're on x86 and you want to get the value in RAX at some time, you use the thread context to get that value out of it. So this is used a lot like in um, syscall emulation mode to uh, implement the system calls. You have to get the current state of the process, which you can do through the um, thread context. OK. OK, so let's um, look at how we're going to be using uh, these CPU models, which I think we've seen uh, some examples of this already. OK, so uh, back over to our live coding examples. So we are going to look at what happens if we use atomic CPU and timing CPU with two different cache sizes, run these um, experiments real fast, and kind of see what uh, the results are. OK, so let's open up. Um, so we're going to materials using Gem 5, 0, 2, and then 0, 4 cores. Um, and we're going to open up cores.py. Okay. So this core is already set to atomic. Um, so let's just run what we have here. So we have the CPU type is atomic. So in this case, we're using um, the, apologies. We're going to use the simple processor like what we were doing yesterday. Um, and we're going to be using RISC-5 this time for something different. Um, and what we're going to run is this matrix multiply example. So maybe a slightly interesting workload. So let's start with atomic, run this. So gem5 um, cores.py. And I am going to save this in a separate output directory because we're going to be comparing some things. I'm going to save this in uh, atomic normal caches. All right. So one of the things you'll notice here is that we had to download this matrix multiply because it was not found locally. Um, and then we have a bunch of output. Um, and we need to wait for a minute for it to run. OK, so now it's done. Hopefully this validated. And so in our uh, directory that we just uh, created atomic normal caches, um, we can see 
if we open up stats.txt, we have a time that it took. So even though we were using the atomic CPU model, Gem5's event queue was still executing, so time was progressing. But as we'll see in a minute, this time doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't mean much using atomic. OK? So now, next step, let's change this to timing. And rerun it. This time, output to timing normal caches. Um, while that's running, uh, one thing I'll say is like, uh, oftentimes, if you're uh, writing a Gem5 script, a Python script to do these kinds of tests, where what you're doing is like, you know, you're interested in changing the CPU type and changing the size of the caches in this case, um, you can use like Python's arg parse to make it where you pass in arguments to your script as to exactly what experiment to do. So when I'm doing this, I'll often know ahead of time what the experiment is that I want to run, and then just set up a Python script that takes in one parameter, which is like the name of the experiment, or my experimental conditions. OK, so the timing CPU ran. We got the same answer. That's great. Um, let's open up this stats real fast and see what it looks like. Um, and we got a different uh, time for the, or yeah, a different result for the time. So that's good. That means we actually changed something. OK. So now let's see what happens if we change the size of the cache. So let's rerun this. Instead of using a 32 kilobyte cache, let's make it a super tiny cache, a one kilobyte cache. Um, and rerun it. And this time, we're going to, instead of using normal caches, we're going to output it to small caches. So what do we think is going to happen? Do we think that the simulated time is going to be more or less when we use smaller caches? Who thinks it's the simulated time is going to be higher when we use smaller caches? Great. You all have passed Computer Architecture 101. What about, um, as we're waiting for this to run, do you think that the simulated time, so, so the time the simulator takes to simulate this, do you think that time, the host time, is going to be more with smaller caches, with bigger caches, or the same? The same? The same? So we can check on these things and see. So let's open up the small caches. Oh, typo. So great. Some seconds is higher than what we saw with the timing normal. So that was two milliseconds. With the small caches, it was three milliseconds. So that means we all know what, how computers work. Um, I will note also the host seconds is 36 compared to 28. So it actually took a, somewhat longer on the host as well. And this is essentially because we had to simulate more time in the host. Or the simulator was simulating more time. We simulated 30 milliseconds instead of 20 milliseconds. There's just more for the simulator to do. There was some more downtime for the simulator, but it did end up taking longer. So it's usually true if you're simulating for a longer time, whatever your slower condition is will often take longer to simulate as well. OK, finally, I want to switch this back to Atomic to kind of see what happens if we use Atomic with tiny caches. So rerun this one last time. Um, I'm going to run Gem5, output to Atomic, small caches. Um, run this. So this should actually take about the same amount of time as what the Atomic took before, um, since in theory the cache size shouldn't affect the way the Atomic uh, works. So Atomic bypasses the caches. It's supposed to take no time. So we'll see what happens here. So given that, that Atomic bypass, by, bypasses the caches and takes no time, 
What do we think um, we're going to see when we look at the stats here? Um, compared to the other atomic with the normal caches, do we think that the simulated time will be more or less? Or the same? OK. Most people think the same. We have 12 milliseconds compared to about 12 milliseconds. So it's about the same. Cool. So again, this is just basically to reinforce um, that the um, atomic CPU does not do timing. So don't use it for um, this. Um, the other thing you can look at, um, so uh, I'll often, when doing things like this, and I want to compare the output, just use grep to compare the output. So we can use grep minus r. Um, so grep for, let's look at the num cycles. So this will give us the number of cycles that um, each thing took and look in um, here. So again, the two atomics took about the same, oh, exactly the same number of cycles. And then we see a higher number of cycles for the small caches compared to the large caches. Okay. So that's um, one thing we looked at. Oh, and another thing we can look at here, I, w I won't run this since this is the results that you see, uh, but if you look at the number of ops across all these, we executed exactly the same number of ops. Um, you'll notice if you also look for instructions, I see. Um, so you can look for the number of ops and instructions, and I guess, I guess I'll look at this real fast. So the sim instructions and the sim ops are not necessarily the same. They're really close for risk 5 since risk 5 is a risk ISA. So most of risk 5 instructions are not broken down into micro ops, but it looks like at least one or two was in this situation. So all of the ISAs in Gym 5 can have their instructions broken down into micro ops. X86 heavily uses this, everything in X86. All the instructions are broken down into micro ops. There are very few instructions that are a single micro op. On ARM, most instructions are broken down into micro ops. Risk 5 most aren't. Um, but you'll always see a difference between instructions and ops. So be careful whether you're looking at the instruction right or the op right. Yeah, there's a question here. Are SIMOPs always strictly larger than instructions, or can Gen 5 also do um, instruction coalescing into yeah. operation? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the number of, we, we don't have any model to do like macro op fusion or anything. So an instruction is broken down into ops, and then those ops are executed. There's no fu fusing going on in the back end. That'd be a cool thing to add, though. Um, I'll also, I don't know if we'll talk about this later. I don't think we do. Um, so now I will note, uh, especially for x86, the micro op or the, mac, the, the instruction to micro op conversion is very unrealistic. Um, the number of ops that Gem 5 thinks is going to execute is much, much, much higher than what happens on Intel or AMD processors. So be careful with that. At least be aware that that's a problem. OK, uh, any other questions here? Um, OK, so next I want to go through creating a custom processor, which I think we looked at um, this yesterday as well. Um, OK, so what we were going to do is make two different kinds of processors, a big out-of-order processor and a little out-of-order processor where we were changing the width, ROB size, num and reg, so similar to what we saw yesterday. Um, so we would set up these two um, different um, processors with these 
two different things. So one has a width of 10. The other one has a width of 2. Then run these two processors, um, which you can do if you would like uh, using the complete directory. And then we are going to compare the um, results. And these results look something like this. So the big processor was, what is that, 20, 30% faster than the little processor. 